Thank you, Chris, and hello to everyone, <laughs> especially those of you who are joining from other time zones. Um, I am so thrilled to be a part of this series and to be able to share my past and present research, which is looking at this intersection of contemporary art and children's play. Um, how I am going to run the next like 40 or so minutes is to start off talking a little bit about my background, working as a curator, designing play spaces for kids in Australia, um, and then moving over to the UK where I did my PhD research in partnership with Tate and the University of Nottingham. And so I'll share with you some, what happened in that body of work and the kind of key findings from that and how that research is forming um, or shaping my current work at Harvard in relation to the graduate uh, courses that I teach and the current study that I'm working on, which is looking at the integration of modern and contemporary art practices into public school curriculum. So we will have time for questions at the end, but if you have any like thoughts or ideas or questions along the way, please feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, okay, so I began my career designing play spaces for kids at the Ipswich Art Gallery in Australia. And um, Ipswich is a really special place. It's a very diverse community um, and we um, had a real uh, vision at the gallery to be um, engaging with children and families as our primary audience. And so we designed these immersive play spaces for children. Uh, for example, this show Wild Things, where the kids would come in and they would make wearable art to put on their body. And then they would turn into a wild thing themselves on the big grassy hill. Um, so kind of like some core like understandings or principles that were being activated in this uh, program were around the importance of tactile sensory based interactions in children's learning, but also really thinking about the connection between all of the creative amazing things that artists do with materials and how we can put that into a form that children can take up and explore through their playing. And so it was at this time that I also became really curious with like how we can like take different artworks like different artworks that may have been designed not with children in mind and look at the different creative things that artists are doing with the materials and the tools and put that into a form that children can then explore through their play. Um, and so in 2015, I made the move from Australia over to England uh, to start my PhD research. And I did a collaborative doctoral award, which from what I understand is something that is quite unique to the UK, uh, in which I was like placed uh, in the learning department at Tate. So I had a supervisor who was Dr. Emily Pringle, who was the head of learning and research at Tate. And then I had a second supervisor at the University of Nottingham, Pat Thompson. And, um, who were both kind of like guiding and mentoring me throughout like my PhD studies. Um, so my PhD research really looked at the design of learning spaces for young children in art museums and how we can integrate young children's voices into the curatorial process. And so at its heart, the research was really looking at this question of how can children's learning be connected to art museum practices? And then under that big umbrella, really thinking about the different mediators that uh, facilitate young children's learning uh, within an art museum space, and then thinking about what sort of strategies we can use for connecting curatorial practices, like what kind of like reflective strategies or like evaluation strategies. And then finally, like through working in Australia, and like traveling around the world and seeing all of these like amazing educational programs for children and families and museums, I started to notice that there weren't actually a lot of resources out there that were really available to help people in the design of learning environments that really connect, you know, artistic practice and young children's learning. So entering the PhD, I really had this strong intention to think about what practical resources I could develop that I could then share with others um, to be able to, you know, think about how we infuse creativity in children's lives, not only in museums, but in like school settings or at home. Okay. So this work is really situated at the intersection of like museum education, visual art and early childhood education. And so 
I was I began the study at a time where there was like a really strong push in the UK around like preparing young children for their entrance into school. So what this resulted in was a really significant reduction in the amount of time that was dedicated to play and the arts in like young children's experiences in preschools. Yet at the same time, when you look at like the United Nations conventions on the rights of the child, it does explicitly state that children have the human right to have their opinions listened to and responded to by adults and I was really thinking about okay at this time when there's this like real diminishing of play um you know like how do we make opportunities for this within like more informal spaces like such as in museums or in homes and what role specifically can it like contemporary art museum play in allowing children to have these sorts of very creative playful experiences this research also happened at a time when young children were becoming an increasingly large and significant audience for art museums all around the world. And many museums were thinking about like their kind of like core purpose, like is their core purpose just to put these like exhibitions on display or is their core purpose around offering an array of different like public programs and educational opportunities such as doing like artist residencies and, you know, having different like performances and um, school holiday events and thinking really broadly around what the core mission and output of an art museum is. And at the same time, you know, in recent years, there's been a real shift across the museum education sector and rethinking really about like the role of like a traditional educator and moving away from just, you know, the museum educator, like kind of like programming events that accompany like adult exhibitions. So, for example, you know, if there's like a Van Gogh exhibition on developing like a little toddler workshop where the toddlers go and see the different artworks and do a drawing activity in response to that. So there's been a move away from that to more towards thinking about the role of the educator as more of a learning curator. So a curator that is like setting up the conditions for learning, that's the, an educator who is like really creative, um, who is making these like really interesting connections between artworks and creative practice and broader communities. And so thinking about the different literature from the visual arts sector that informed this research, I was really uh, heavily influenced by the work of Elliot Eisner and his work around um, sensory based learning, thinking of art as a language um, in which children can communicate through different modalities in the world, you know, in different ways that go beyond just like written text um, or numbers. Uh, I've also been very heavily influenced by Gert Biesta's beautiful writing about, you know, art and art as a way of being in dialogue with the world. Um, you know, however, like a big trend that we've seen in education systems all around the world is this like real push for like standardized testing and standardized testing in math and literacy. And so what that has led to is like a real marginalization from of the arts from school curriculum. So my research was really thinking about with like all these different kind of factors going on, you know, what is the role of the contemporary art museum in relation to young children's learning? And how can we be designing these really high quality arts experiences that allow children to have agency and use their creativity and engage meaningfully with different artists and artistic processes? So I then started out to do my research project. Um, and what I really loved about my PhD was that it was very practically situated. So I used a methodology called action research. And so um, this was when I was using my skills as a learning curator, as an artist, as an educator within the research team. And so my research team was also the same team that was developing and facilitating uh, the different learning activities. So I worked with two different art museums on my field work. The first was the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, and the second was uh, Tate Britain and Tate Modern. And so within like our, um, the, the team that were part of the research study, we had five learning curators, three artists, and a total of 65 children um, who participated in the different events. And so the different methods that we used to like explore the research project sorry, the research focus, were observations and field notes of different gallery activities, uh, doing different interviews with the artists, with the children, uh, with the learning curators. Another really big piece of the work was thinking about how we make young children's learning visible. And so we activated the Reggio Emilia uh, methodology of pedagogical documentation and thinking about how that can be how that can work within like an art museum setting uh, to give visibility to young children's like creative processes and have that as a starting point for evaluation and reflection of the art museum team. Um, 
and also like using that documentation to help like challenge different assumptions or ideas that different people within the museum had about young children. And so the aim of the overall project was to develop a set of practical strategies, practices and resources to help educators design play spaces that connect young children's learning with curatorial and artistic practices in art museums. Okay, so this is a little timeline um, of my research study and you know how it played out between 2015 and 2019. So I started off doing an initial reconnaissance. So this was like I was doing different like literature review, looking at like the different like debates and tensions um, around young children's learning in art museums. I then went and did my first action research cycle. So this was uh, out at the Whitworth Art Gallery. I moved to Manchester. I worked with their early years team um, to like look at young children's learning in the gallery space. I then spent uh, numerous months doing evaluation and reflection from that initial uh, set of like data collection. I then went into doing a second action research cycle um, and that was in the early years and family program at Tate. And I then spent two years writing up and pulling all of my findings together. Okay, so here's a visual illustration of that method methodological process. So you can see on the right, those action research cycles happening, um, whether it's cycling through different uh, processes of identifying an action research problem, planning, facilitation, reflection, and change. And then off to the left, you can see a second like action research cycle happening. So each of those cycles on the left were the different like gallery activities that were running. Um, and uh, they were, so for each, you know, say like workshop uh, that we ran with the kids, there was also a process of planning, facilitation, reflection, and change, which then fed back into the bigger action research cycle. I also used activity theory as an analytical framework um, for evaluating like the overall like pra education practices that were emerging from both of the gallery sites. All right, so digging in uh, in a little bit more detail to that first action research cycle. So uh, this was run at in the early years Atelier program at the Whitworth Art Gallery. The Whitworth have a really long history of like having fantastic public programs and you know educational opportunities for people of all ages. It is a gallery that is housed within the University of Manchester. Um, and they had like a very established early years uh, program that was in place well before I started working with them. So I um, worked in partnership with their um, a, a two different artists and their early years learning curator to run 12 different uh, children's activities over a three month period. And so during this time, um, I was interviewing the artists and the curators before and after each gallery session. Um, I was also doing like observations of the children and families like within the Atelier drop-in um, activity happening. And so this first action research cycle drew heavily upon constructivist learning theory. So I was looking at the work of like the Gotsky, Bruna, Rogoff, and thinking about how learning is produced by a dynamic and negotiated process within a specific context. Um, I also looked really carefully at different literature that had been done around the design of constructivist learning environments. And so something that I drew heavily upon was like thinking about the critical role of the different components of a constructivist learning environment. For example, the need to have different problem spaces and cognitive tools, collaborative tools, case studies, and different resources that learners can draw on to help facilitate their learning over time. Okay, and I was also, you know, really thinking about like, if we are designing these spaces for kids, how do we design them in a way that allows like for scaffolding to happen over like an extended period of time? So scaffolding in the sense of like, showing children different artworks and thinking about how that might open up their understandings of the potential of like different materials and their play with them. Um, scaffolding terms of like introducing vocabulary and techniques and the use of different tools and how all of those different like cognitive resources would open up opportunities for them to extend their experimentation and creativity over time. Um, I was also thinking a lot about the design of the physical environment um, and, you know, different 
scholars who had talked about, you know, the environment as the third teacher and the affordances of different loose part materials such as blocks, paint, paints, clay and natural materials and how these different like manipulables are really, really important in allowing children to interact with um, spaces in like divergent and really meaningful ways. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of one of the early years Artilia uh, activities that was run as part of Action Research Cycle 1. So for each of the activities, we used a research question as a starting point for curating uh, the design of the space. So for this particular uh, Artilia, we were thinking about how can we explore colour mixing through plastics. And so we started off looking at different artworks um, initially in the Whitworth Art Gallery's collection. So here we have David Batchelor's Plato's Disco, um, which is a site specific installation in which, you know, the artist is exploring all these ideas around colour mixing and translucency and um, transparency and light. Um, however, like obviously David Batchelor's artwork has not been created specifically for children. It's using, you know, glass. Um, it's using different materials that might not be appropriate for two or three year olds to play with. But we we're thinking about, OK, but how can that be the starting point for like our kind of creative inspiration as artists and as curators? And so we were also had a look at Baha Yurokuklu's work, who does these beautiful like acrylic um, installations. Again, not originally created for kids, but when I look at this, I think, oh, Oh my gosh, there's so much going on here uh, that has such rich possibilities for young children's learning and play. And also thinking about the art of like Rebecca Bauman and how she explores um, reflection and light um, through the different installations that she creates. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, like different artists hadn't necessarily used materials that were like safe for little kids to use. So we were thinking about, okay, with this concept of colour mixing, like what other materials could we give the kids so that they can like freely play with this safely so we're thinking about different like light gel filters colorful water colorful transparencies um and then thinking about how we could like set up those things in a way that encourage children to like play together so instead of having like individual like um, workstations, thinking about how we lay out the materials in a way that allow children to really use their full bodies and to interact with the space and to um yeah, kind of engage in this like very tactile collaborative play. And here's some documentation of their play during that colour mixing um, plastic atelier. So you can see the kind of complexity of their learning, like in relation to like exploring different concepts around shadow, opacity, colour depth, transparency, um, but also the kind of social learning that's going on between children and their peers and adults. Okay, so we did, so after that colour mixing atelier, we did another 11 different uh, gallery activities and through each of these activities, I was refining the different resources that I was developing. I was develop I was also refining the different kind of like theoretical framework that was informing the research that I was doing. So coming out of that initial action research cycle, um, I had an initial draft of what I now call the curating place space template. And so uh, this is something that I use like every day in my work with students and with teachers now. And it is essentially like a, a template that people can use to help design the starting kind of learning environment, thinking about how they kind of then scaffold and extend uh, learning while a session is being facilitated, and then how you reflect on and evaluate uh, learning at the end. However, something that was really interesting coming out of that first action research cycle is that it was very clear that there was an incongruency between like the observations that were made of children's interactions with the materials and the space and the initial literature review that had been done around constructivist learning theory. And that incongruency was in relation to the importance of like materials and how young children were working like in dialogue with these different materials and the importance of space and the arrangement and aesthetic like components of the space. This was something that the constructivist learning theory like literature just hadn't like acknowledged. So I realised that I needed to do 
another literature review before going into action research cycle two that kind of like really looked at those gaps and looked at what different people had written around materiality and space. Um, but also coming out of that first action research cycle, there had been like some big successes around like the use of the different like research questions to shape the kind of like curatorial thinking before, during and after each gallery activity. Um, there had also been uh, the development of like some key or identifying some key kind of practice principles, such as like children's learning environments uh, need to be created to support dynamic learning, like over an extended period of time. And we really needed to be thinking about the unique affordances of art museums as really distinct sites of learning for young children. And in particular, how we can draw on these different contemporary and modern art practices to support young children's learning and development. Okay, and so this is an example, um, well, it is the uh, curating place based template, just to give you a feel for what that looked like at that point. Um, so you can see here, this is like the different components that were being considered in like designing the initial play space. So like identifying different like materials, concepts, identifying some sort of research question, you know, for example, you know, how can we explore colour mixing through plastics? And then um, also like identifying a space in which like learning curators and educators can like draw out and think about the initial like layout of the materials and spaces. Okay, and then on the yellow here is like what happens when the play space is being facilitated. So thinking about the different scaffolding tools and materials, um, thinking about like how you can extend children's learning through introducing different art techniques, vocabulary words, asking different play prompts, and then thinking about different reflective questions you can use to support um, children's metacognitive learning processes. So digging into this in a little bit more detail, like thinking about um, curating the initial play space design in a way that kind of thinks about these four very distinct components. So the main material, um, the kind of, you know, for example, whether that be like plastic or whether it be like natural materials, light or paint, and then thinking about like key concepts and connecting those materials with concepts. So a concept could be like line, shape, form, color, texture. Uh, and then thinking about, you know, the social components of the learning environment, like how will the materials be la laid out to encourage social interactions between children and their peers and adults. And then finally, the spatial component, like, you know, like how are we gonna lay out these materials present this experience for kids in a way that encourages them to use their full like tactile sensory systems. All right, and then digging into the different scaffolding tools, like thinking about uh, different like art techniques you could introduce to kids, different play prompts, vocabulary, um, additional materials and equipment that can be used to um, support their learning and scaffold learning over time. All right, so coming out of that, I then went into action, action research cycle two, which was uh, conducted at Tate in London. And so Tate, like the Whitworth, has a very established, amazing uh, learning program that I was able to come into. A key point of distinction between the two galleries was, you know, Tate is a major tourist attraction that has like 7 million visitors a year. Um, and so in terms of like young children's learning, it, it creates like a very different set of like challenges and opportunities. Uh, something else that's significant to mention is that Tate has, uh, and well before I started there, a very established uh, learning program that is based on an approach which they term practice as research. So this is like where they are situating their practice as museum educators as like a form of research and they develop their learning program in a way that is very, very inquiry driven. So they are constantly as a team asking different, different questions and using that to kind of like fuel uh, the development of their different like programs. And then they're in this like continuous state of like reflection and evaluation um, and so I was able to like come into this environment and like think about, okay, so how does that work in terms of like really young children and their learning and development? So I worked with the Early Years and Family Program at Tate Britain uh, for three months. And similar to the Whitworth, I was doing pre and post session interviews with the team. I was doing observations of the different gallery activities. And I was also like helping to run and facilitate these um, different events at Tate. And so uh, before starting the action research um, cycle two 
data collection, I also did a really significant literature review around new materialist learning theory. So new materialism, you know, it is a critical framework that has been used across many different areas of research and practice. Um, but it, I was heavily influenced by the work of like Karen Barad um, and Rosie Bray Dotty and how they talk about materials as not just being passive things that humans project meaning onto, but as something that plays an active role in the development of thinking and learning and knowledge. And so my understanding of new materialism was that children and materials work in dialogue with one another to mutually transform each other over time. And that these different materials open up different learning pathways. So when we think about that in relation to young children's learning and development, it's really important that kids have the opportunity to play and make with an array of different materials uh, because all these materials open up different opportunities for learning. So like the opportunities or the invitations that something like a wooden block makes might be connected to like a range balance, size and gravity, whereas the invitations that something like paint makes are really different, like it's more connected to like texture, consistency, colour and movement. Okay, yeah, I think this is the quote that kind of, I guess, kind of illustrates that point in a bit more detail. So new materialism as an understanding where one's attention shifts from intra and interpersonal relationships towards a material discursive relationship between all living organisms in the material environment. Okay. So yeah, I, I think like there were there were a lot of congruencies between that new materialist kind of literature and constructivism. There were also some points where it really expanded the thinking. And I think where the, the key kind of points of expansion were around this emphasis on materials and materiality um, and like the important role that they that materials play in the formation of learning and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was thinking about how do we then merge this like constructivist learning theory and bring it together with new materialism to like construct a like much more expanded framework, you know, for the design of learning environments and like how we also bring that together with the experimental practices of artists and designers. But doing this, like kind of, it generated this like very um, expansive possibilities for children's creative learning because it was the constructivist learning theory really had that really clear kind of like different components like we need the problem space we need the cognitive tools we need the different resources but then the new materialist theory kind of like laid in this like very like creative emphasis on materials which materials you know a huge part of both artistic practice and early childhood education um but it kind of like yeah brought the attention to the materials in a whole new way All right, so this is an example of one of the children's play activities from um, Tate Britain. So we, again, we used research questions to like inform our thinking before, during and after the activity. And we use this particular question for this activity. How can we explore shape through paper? And so our starting point was Jessica Dismore's Related Forms, uh, which is a piece that is in the Tate collection. And you can see here, um, this is the artist Anya, who I worked with, and uh, she had laid out like different, um, like large kind of abstract shapes on the ground uh, using different papers, like tissue paper and aluminium foil and butcher's paper. And she really wanted to like have a space for like babies to play in because we knew that there will be quite a few babies coming on the day. Um, and you can see here one of the babies like crawling through that space and the kind of complexity of the learning that is happening there and like how as they crawl they're exploring different concepts like gravity and movement and texture and um, size and weight. And um, we were also thinking about how we could like integrate different uh, additional reflective strategies. So we'd use the research questions in the first action research cycle. Uh, but here we started to like explore um, like how we could like have the, the documentation of the children's learning and pair that alongside like a different text. So at the top um, of the screen, you can see there is a quote by Tim Ingold, who is a social anthropologist who has written a lot about materials and materiality. And so we're thinking, okay, so if we have these two kind of texts sitting next to each other, the visual text and the written text, how does that then kind of like prompt our thinking in different ways? And so part of the, the thinking behind this was that, you know, when we initially used the research questions in the first action 
research cycle. That was really great. But a lot of our conversations kind of kept circling back to the same topics and ideas. So through introducing the other text, the Ingold text, um, the ambition behind that was is to kind of like extend the thinking and extend like the different connections that could be made between the children and the museum space. And down the bottom, you can see some different quotes um, from our team, from the different learning curators and the artist um, and myself that, you know, think about how, what happens when we bring these things together. All right, so coming out of that second action research cycle, then had like a much kind of more uh, clearer and well-constructed version of the curating place space template. Uh, we had a much more expanded set of different reflection strategies uh, that included both um, research questions, but also the use of, um, you know, bringing the two different texts together, which is called rhizoanalysis. And also we explored Derrida's idea of mapping meanings. Um, also had a kind of like robust set of different practice principles that informed like the design and curation of these learning environments. And um, also like a really great set of practical resources that we could like share it with other people um, for them to design different learning environments for kids. Okay, and here's some of these reflection strategies um, in action again. And here's some of those practice principles. So I'll just talk about this for a moment. Um, so when we're thinking about the practice principles that emerge from the research, we're thinking about like three different areas. Um, we're thinking about it in relation to like art museum staff and like the kind of key like understandings or like um, what their kind of roles need to embody. So thinking about learning curators, artists and children, all as co-constructors of art museum practices. Um, and additionally, that teams need to actively plan for scaffolding over time. So they need to like actively be thinking about how they set up the initial learning environment, but then thinking about as children make and play, like how does the material and tools kind of scaffold the learning, but what are like different prompts and ideas that um, adults could introduce that kind of extend the learning over time. Um, that artists also need to bring that kind of rich understanding of different materials and their kind of like creative affordances and they can draw on that to help like design an initial learning environment that is like um, really creative for kids. Then thinking about like the different art museum spaces and what they, ne they need to embody, the spaces need to be considered in relation to their social, conceptual, material and spatial mediators. So we, when we're designing a learning environment, we need to be thinking about all four of those components. In addition to that, um, we also need to be thinking about, you know, how we integrate young children's voices, um, whether that be through like recording or taking different imagery. Um, and really thinking about learning in a holistic way. So thinking about learning as a process that is social, emotional, cognitive and embodied. And when we're designing learning environments, like it needs to be, you know, drawing upon all of these things. So also coming out um, of that second action research cycle, I produced the article uh, Material Matters in Children's Creative Learning, uh, which was published through MIT's Journal of Design and Science. So if you were interested in digging into the merging of these philosophies and the, this framework and seeing an example of this uh, framework in action, you can check out that article. All right, so. I'm then going to make a shift across the Atlantic. Uh, so after finishing my PhD, um, I uh, got a postdoc position at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So in February 2020, I made the move um, from Britain to Boston. And, <clears throat> you know, it was really interesting coming to the US. Um, as an early childhood educator, uh, so I think like one major point of difference is around, you know, Britain having like a national curriculum and then you come to the US and it's the curriculum like there is no national curriculum like there's um every like kind of local district will have its own curriculum that they use like I have been in preschools in Boston where there will be like two preschool classrooms and they are both using two different curriculums it is wild so the the pedagogically the education system here can be quite fragmented. Um, and that was something that, you know, when we're thinking about, well, how do we ensure that the arts are being um, connected with young children? It is like a totally different set of challenges and opportunities. 
Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about like how that work that I did in England is like uh, how I'm applying it and exploring it and expanding upon it in my current work at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So I feel like um, one piece of the puzzle that I think a lot about in my current role is how we cultivate the next generation of arts educators who are going to be advocating for, you know, really experimental creative practices and bringing these out to settings where, um, communities who may not have access to high quality arts experiences um, are, are happening and like how we can like um, expand and amplify that to make sure that the arts are getting out um, to, to where it's where they're needed most. And so at HGSE, um, in particular, I teach a course that is called Contemporary Art in Early Childhood Education. And within this, we explore the different like um, pedagogical possibilities of bringing together this constructivist and new materialist like framing um, for young children's creative learning. So uh, each week we have like a theoretical workshop where we look at different like theories and ideas like related to kind of play and to contemporary art and to um, yeah museum education practices and then we also have like a two-hour studio workshop each focused on a different material you can see some examples here from a construction cardboard construction workshop um, which was inspired by Charlotte Posenesque's work and her different like modular um, cardboard parts the students then use the curating play space template to design different learning environments and then they bring those out into preschools and facilitate them with kids um, so that has been like a really interesting way to kind of like see, you know, how that resource has been like taken and, you know, um, used by the students. But also I feel like, you know, teaching at the university is like incredibly inspiring because the students ask questions and they take and develop these different ideas in ways that I did not anticipate. Um, another really exciting like continuation of this work uh, is with the current art play study that uh, Steve Seidel and I are currently leading, which is looking at the integration of modern and contemporary arts practices into public school curriculum. So we are working really closely with the Department of Early Childhood at Boston Public Schools uh, to think about how we can be integrating, you know, different contemporary and modern art practices into their three and four year old curriculum. Um, and so we are also working closely with uh, the Smithsonian Learning Lab, MoMA and the Harvard Art Museums to utilise different artworks and artistic practices from their collection in the design of the different curriculum activities. Um, and we are also uh, cultivating different opportunities for professional development um, for the public school teachers that accompany the different um, activities. So, you know, for example, you know, like thinking about how we, if there is a, an, uh, an activity around, you know, cardboard construction, bringing them into the art museum to show them like Louise Nevelson's like installations and talk about that and then giving them an opportunity to make and play with the cardboard. Um, and I guess the idea that sits behind that is that in order for teachers to be able to like implement these ideas with kids, they need to like first kind of experience the joy of making and playing themselves. Um, but the art play study, I'm um, so thrilled that this is happening. Um, the curriculum has just started to roll out like this month. Um, so it's still in its in progress. Um, but to give it a little bit of context around it, you know, the Boston Public Schools has a really long history of like really investing in its early childhood education. Um, and, you know, the uh, BPS has had a, a very established um, Department of Early Childhood since 2005. Um, what is unique or what's merged over the past few years is the expansion of their universal pre-K offering uh, to include both three and four year olds who um, are going to preschool across like district schools and community-based organizations. So what uh, the art play team at Project Zero have been doing is working really closely with the curriculum designers and the different coaches from the Department of Early Childhood to write and rewrite their three and four year old curriculums um, and to plan and run different professional development opportunities that, that accompany them. So you can see on the right here an example of a sound sculpture activity uh, that was run as part of that. Um, so sound sculptures will be in this new curriculum and will run different professional development and trainings that connect to that. 
And these are some of the research questions. So the, uh, yeah, the research questions are really kind of focused on like looking at the different practices that facilitate these artistic practices, sorry, artistic experiences for children and teachers, thinking about how both teachers and children like experiences these like artistic environments, um, questions of like, how do we evaluate children's learning within these curriculum experiences? And also what are the affordances of partnership um, between contemporary artists, art museums, you know, public school systems and universities? So we're hoping that we will have um, some clearer um, findings to share with you all by next summer. Um, but it's certainly a space that I'm really excited about because like often you see these really awesome like arts programs happening in um, like charter schools or private schools, but you don't always see it like on the same kind of scale in the public schools. So it's some, a space that um, I'm really, I'm really passionate about and I'm really um, curious to see how this emerges over the next year or so. But here's some imagery of the different professional development workshops that have been running. Um, this one looking at, you know, light and color and reflection. Um, so he's starting off with like Laszlo Moholy Naj's light prop, which you can see in the top center there um, as a starting point for inspiration. So showing teachers that artwork and then having them creatively experiment and play um, with different media that, you know, allow them to explore light as a creative material. So this work is really thinking about this intersection of, you know, how we design play spaces for kids that kind of draw together, you know, children and their unique backgrounds and um, the curriculum itself and then contemporary arts practice. So I do just want to like leave time for your questions. Um, so I might, Chris and hang on, did we have any questions that came through during the talk that might be a nice starting point for that discussion? <laughs> 